Hello everybody, my name is Amalia Lopez and today I will be presenting to you the biography and mathematical contributions by the mathematician Leonard Euler. Leonard Euler's story begins in April 15, 1707, where he was born to Paulus Euler and Margarita Brucker in Switzerland. His father was a Protestant minister and they lived in a cramped parish residence. At the age of 13, Euler was enrolled at the University of Basel. It was very common to enroll this young at university during this era. And here he learned elementary mathematics from Johann Bernoulli. His mathematical capabilities quickly caught the attention of Bernoulli, who encouraged him to read more advanced, book, more advanced books on his own and made himself available to answer questions on Saturdays. At the age of 16, Euler graduated with a master's degree and succumbed to his parents' wishes of being a, the a theologian. Fortunately, his father eventually accepted that Euler was meant to study mathematics in part by Bernoulli, who advocated on his behalf. Euler originally planned for a position as a professor in the University of Basel but didn't attain this due to his young age and lack of publications. Fortunately, after receiving an invitation from the Academy of Sciences in St. Petersburg in 1726, he was able to dedicate himself to mathematical studies. Euler quickly uh, started to learn Russian and adapted to his new life. His mathematical discoveries made him instantly world famous. In 1734, he was married to Katharina Giselle, and they had 13 children together, and their oldest, Johann Albrecht, became a mathematician himself. In 1740, Euler was invited by the Prussian king, Frederick II, to build an Academy of Sciences in Berlin. Since the Tsarina Anna Ivanova died and there was social unrest in Russia, Euler decided to accept his offer. King Frederick, having to deal with war matters, took until 1746 to set up the academy. When it was finally built, Euler became the, dire the director of mathematical class and was assigned many responsibilities, such as overseeing the botanical gardens, staff affairs, finances, and the sale of almanacs. However, Euler remained mathematically productive since his arrival to Berlin. The president of the academy was originally Pierre-Louis Moreau de Maupertuis, but after an ugly dispute concerning plagiarism, Maupertuis left and Euler was left as temporary president. Unfortunately, uh, King Frederick and Euler had incompatible differences in personalities, so the king never official, officially offered him the position as permanent president of the academy. And after several candidates turned down the position, Frederick declared himself president. In 1766, Euler's ego was hurt, and he accepted an offer from the Empress Catherine II and returned to Russia. At the Academy of Sciences in Russia, Euler finally achieved the respect and prestige he lacked in Berlin. Alas, he experienced much personal misfortune during this time. In 1771, he went almost completely blind after being operated to remove a cataract on his only eye, as he had previously lost an eye before. Later that year, his house burned down and he barely made it out alive. In 1773, his wife, Katharina, died, and he was forced to remarry so that he wouldn't be a burden on his children and his wife would look after him. Astonishingly, this period of his life in Russia was the most productive, as he wrote over half of all his publications in this time, with the help of several others, such as his oldest son, Johann. Euler died of a stroke while playing with one of his grandchildren on September 18, 1783. Leonard Euler is certainly among one of the most prestigious mathematicians in history, and the most prolific as well, having written over 900 books. 
His works varied from geometry to calculus to trigonometry to algebra to number theory, as well as optics, astronomy, cartography, mechanics, weights and measures, and even the theory of music. Additionally, Euler is responsible for much of the mathematics notation that we use now. Many of you may recognize such notation uh, that includes uh, letters and symbols such as E, I, F of X, sigma, that means uh, summation, the common variables A, B, C, X, Y, C, the trig uh, functions for sine, cosine, tangent, cotangent, etc., and pi. His purpose was to standardize math notation as to increase collaboration amongst mathematicians. Euler made several contributions to the branch of number theory, which were probably influenced by his interactions with the Bernoullis and Goldbach. He disproved Fermat's conjecture, which stated that 2n plus 1 always yielded a prime number if n is a power of 2. He also introduced the Euler phi function, which um, is the number of non-negative integers less than n that are relatively prime to n. And you might remember this if you took number theory. However, the most popular discovery attributed to Euler is probably Euler's identity, e to the power of i times pi plus 1 equals 0, which combines arithmetic, calculus, trigonometry, and complex analysis, and which many mathematicians have deemed the most beautiful formula in mathematics. Unfortunately, this is a misconception because Euler himself never explicitly wrote this formula in his published works. He implicitly made use of it in the first letter he sent to Goldbug. It's possible that he learned this from Bernoulli as this formula was first issued by the uh, English mathematician Roger Coates, who died when Euler was only nine years old. On the other hand, a mathematical discovery that can be attributed to Euler was the proof of the Vassal problem, which today we know as the zeta, zeta function of 2. This proof brought young Euler fame as the Vassal problem had defeated many already distinguished mathematicians like the Bernoullis and Leibniz. I will now present to you a proof of the Vassal problem. As you can see, the Vassal problem has to do with what is the summation of 1 over n squared as n goes from 1 to infinity. The proof for the uh, Vassal problem first begins with the Taylor series expansion for sine of x. And then if we conduct a little bit of algebra and divide the Taylor series expansion for sine of x by x, we obtain a second uh, equation. And then if we perform a little bit more algebra and rearrange the terms, we obtain that last expansion, sine of x over x is equal to 1 minus 1 over 3 factorial times x squared plus 1 over 5 factorial um, times x to the fourth power, and so on and so forth. Euler then proceeded by using something known as the wire stress factorization theorem. This was in fact a leap of faith because this theorem would not be proven for a hundred years later. The wire stress factorization theorem asserts that every function can be represented as a maybe infinite product involving its zeros. And so in that manner, Euler created a new representation for the function sine of x. As we can see, the zeros of the function sine of x are, are integral multiples of pi, so negative 3 pi, negative 2 pi, 2 pi, 3 pi, etc. And so we have now a new representation for sine of x, a whole new equation. Okay, so this is awesome, right? We have a whole new equation for sine of x. And so now we, by using a little bit of algebra, we can condense it a little bit. The first thing we're going to do is use a difference of two squares, and then we're going to divide this representation of sine of x by x. 
we can factor the numerators and rearrange it such that we obtain the representation of sine of x divided by x as seen on the last line of the slide. And so now we have two equations for sine of x divided by x. The first equation is the one that we obtained using the Taylor series expansion for sine of x divided by x. And the second equation is the one that we obtained using the wire stress factorization theorem. And so if you remember for algebra, from algebra, uh, we're allowed to set those two equal to each other. And the last bit involves setting the coefficients of x squared equal to each other as well. The coefficients of x squared of the first equation are simply 1 divided by 3 factorial. And the coefficients of x squared on the second equation are everything that's inside of the parentheses. So 1 divided by pi squared plus 1 divided by 2 squared times pi squared plus 1 divided by 3 squared times pi squared, and so on. And now if we um, multiply both sides by pi squared, that will cancel out the pi squared that is found on the denominator of the second equation, giving us that pi squared divided by 6 is equal to 1 divided by 1 squared plus 1 divided by 2 squared plus 1 divided by 3 squared dot dot dot, which is also equal to the summation of 1 divided by n squared as n goes from 1 to infinity. And that concludes our proof of the Basel problem. Euler went on to use similar techniques to prove the set of fun function of s for all even values of s. However, he couldn't do the same for the odd values, and he actually did not believe that this was possible. And until today, this is still an open problem in mathematics. Here are my sources, and that concludes my presentation. Thank you all so much for watching. I hope all of you have great holidays.